And finally, mm -hmm. getting to the point of all of this work on participles and their forms. This is a, an amazing array of participles in Greek. In English, we got like present participles of the type, the 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 sharing, the man sharing the sandwich. We have par, par, past participles like the sandwich. Uh, shared by the man, okay, and mm -hmm. um, not much else, okay. Mm -hmm. In Greek, you get everything, okay. So, uh, why do you have so many? Well, it, it, because it's a really crucial and amazingly powerful way of doing things in language, and we'll see why. So, uh, the book says that there, are, and it's right, that there are two kinds of participles. Well, we're going to learn a third kind later on in the next fall, okay. Um, there are basically two kinds of parcels. The, the, the last kind is really just a subset of the second of these. But they're basically um, remembering that parsiples are adjectives, okay? Um, what distinguishes between the way the two kinds of parsiples work is very straightforward. There are attributive parsiples and circumstantial parsiples. Um, you might want to think of the circumstantial parsiples as predicative parsiples because the difference between them is that par attributive parsiples have an article before them, okay? And by for before them, we mean uh, closely in front of them, either immediately in front of them or uh, or like, like attributive adjectives, okay? The same position as attributive adjectives. And the other kind, the circumstantial parsiples, have no article preceding them. Okay, and that's how you can tell that they're circumstantial. So, and the way they function is totally different. So, so let's look at the attributive parsiples. They're the, the easier and the more restricted class. If you take a parsiple of any kind, okay, and you stick an article in front of it, um, it doesn't have to have it doesn't have to have a noun agreeing with it. In fact, it's the most common use is without. So, we've given you three examples: hoy, that's the nominative plural masculine of the article. And luontes, luontes, just to review, is a present active participle in the nominative plural masculine. Okay, you've got the s ending of the nominative plural masculine, the nt format, which is for active participles, and the stem it's built on. Then there's the thematic vowel o, and the stem that it's built on is lu, which is the present active stem, right? Present stem. So that's hoi luontes. What do we do with these? Well. Here's the, here's the key concept, that attributive parsiples, the best and the simplest way to translate them is like short relative clauses. So hoi luang test means the people who release, those who release, okay? Or the men who release, all of those are possible, right? Um, if we look at the next one, hai, pai dao thao sai, we've got another nominative plural uh, article. This one's feminine. And then the participle we have here is pi dao plus theta epsilon. That's the sign of the aorist passive. That's the aorist passive participle in the nominative plural feminine. So this is going to mean the women who were taught. Okay? Right. That's your, it's a passive participle. It's a relative clause, a short relative clause, the women who were taught. So can you do the next one? Ta, thu, amina. That's your neuter nominative or accusative article. And that participle is built on thu, the, pres the present stem, the first principal part of the verb thuo. You've got your thematic vowel o and then mena. So the mena can be either middle or passive. Okay, let's do it as passive. That's going to mean the things or being sacrificed, the things which are sacrificed. Okay. Again, do it as a relative clause. Don't do the things being sacrificed. Do the things which are sacrificed. That's much more idiomatic in English and much more like the way in which these things work in Greek. Our last example features a participle with a noun agreeing with it as well as, so it's functioning as an adjective. Um, it, we've given you two forms of it in which you repeat the article after the noun, tois anthropois, the dative of the word for man, in the plural, or human being rather, in the plural, and then we repeated the article toys to add uh, the in the attributive position the dative plural masculine participle from the verb kalewo to order. So this would mean the human beings who ordered. Okay, notice it's a, an aorist participle 
It could also be who order in a generic kind of way. Okay, getting the, the difference between present and aorist participles in Greek is, can be tricky. So we translated hoi luantes as the people who release. It would be better to say the people who are releasing, okay, um, as a translation um, instead of release, okay. Um, so because the, the it's not that the, the aorist participle has tense, it's those who order, and we don't have this kind of form in English, but it's in, a, in an inexplicit way, okay, as to the completion or incompletion of it. If that were the perfect participle, which would be kekaleo kasin, it would be kasin, rather, kekaleo kasin, it would be the human beings who have order, right? Um, and you're not going to see, until later, later Greek anyway, future participles that are attributive, because we'll learn what the future participle does. It's quite restricted, okay, in, one, in the other case of the other. All right, so keep that in mind, okay? You see a, a, a participle with an article in front of it, you know enough about what the different voice means, what the aspects mean, translate it into a relative clause, which preserves those features of the verb form, okay? And let's look at the circumstantial participles and how they work. Um, so, are they coming so delayed, up? Yeah. yeah, weird. It will happen. Here we go. Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. Still not there. What the heck? What the heck is right? What do we need to do? There it goes. There we go. Okay, had to touch it. No, okay. Know. So this is the this is the genius of the Greek participle. This is where they really shine and have an amazingly broad use in Greek. And what they do, their function is to provide an alternative way of creating subordinate or dependent clauses in Greek of all types that you can think of. So that means that with a circumstantial participle, one that is not preceded by an article, you can create an if clause, a conditional clause, that is an if clause, a temporal clause, that is one that expresses the time when something happens, a when clause. You can have a concessive clause, an although clause. You can have a causal clause, one that expresses the reason for something, in other words, that's preceded by since. And you can also, in the case of the future participle, and this is the only reason that it exists in earlier Greek, you can also express purpose with the future participle. Um, there are no, there's no need in ancient Greek to have a word for if, a word for when, a word for although, a word for since, or even a word to express purpose, although generally you do that, okay? Mm -hmm. Um, you use, we'll, we'll look at the vocabulary for this. So you can just put the participle there, and Greeks will have enough clues from the contest to know, hopefully, whether it's a concessive participle, meaning although, a causal one, meaning since, a purpose clause, or, a, well, the purpose clause is quite clear because of the futurity of it, but, or a conditional clause, right? So there's no need to put those in. In, or, in cases where there might be ambiguity, Greek does have words that mean although and since that you can use with purpose clause, with, the, with, with participles. Yeah. They're different from the regular words for, for since and, uh, and although, mm -hmm. okay, um, and, and when, okay. But um, um, so this is, the, this is the key function of the participle. You can see that with this huge array of different kinds of, of subordinate clauses, which we use all the time in speaking, mm -hmm. you're gonna, you can't read a Greek sentence practically without running across a parsimony, okay? So let's look at some examples, okay? And the book has uh, examples there on pages, do we write them down? 213 to 216. We get to, get to them? Is it doing its thing? Yeah. It's so to sluggish say. today. I don't know what's the matter. Mm. It needs your magic, Lucy. Come on. <sighs> we don't know why this is happening or not happening. There, oh, it goes. there we go. Just take All right. Minutes. So we've put up a, a a a sentence, a sample sentence. There should be a period at the end of it. That's missing. Um, okay. <laughs> um, but it's a it's a whole sentence which has a circumstantial participle. There is no article in front of it. And that circumstantial participle is the first word, thuon, from the verb thuo, to sacrifice. That's the nominative, singular, masculine of the present active participle. Right? These have a lot of characteristics that you have to define, right? And when you're identifying them. So it's an adjective, remember, okay? Um, and therefore, it is a, if, as an adjective, it's agreeing with some noun 
in the sentence. Um, especially since there's no article in front of it, you have to stop and think. Okay, the article uh, in attributive participles gives away the noun that the participle uh, is is agreeing with, or maybe the participle itself becomes a noun when you stick an article in front of it, those, who, the least, and so forth. But in this case, we've got a, a participle that's an adjective agreeing with the noun, and then it has tadzoa after it, which turns out to be the direct object of the participle, because just as in English participles can have direct objects and indirect objects and all that kind of stuff. So um, thuon is, is the participle agreeing with the subject of the sentence. Tadzoa is a, an accusative plural neuter in this case and means the animals. The next word is ha poietes, the word for poet in the nominative singular masculine. So that's the subject of the sentence. In other words, the word with which thuon agrees. Then we've got hupa tu demu, okay, an agent construction. We've got hupa in the genitive. So that means our verb is is passive. Tu demu is the people in the genitive after hupa, and they're the agent in this sentence. And then the verb is soizatai, is being saved. Third person singular, present, middle, or passive. But we know it's passive in this case because we've got the hopa and the genitive construction. Okay, So how are we going to translate this? And how are we going to translate circumstantial participles in general? So it's a three-step process. And especially if you're, if you're a beginner, it's really important to go through this process. You have to first, maybe we can, number zero, is to fully identify the participle you're looking at. Okay, You can't get anywhere unless you know what what participle you're looking at. So as we said, thuon is nominative singular masculine of the present active participle. So the first thing is to determine what noun the participle agrees with. And we said that in this case, it's ha poietes, right? And then the next step in translating these participles is to choose a kind of clause. Um, and the simplest ones to start with is when. Remember, since it can be when, since, although, or if, and in some cases, in order to that, okay, you, you've got a choice, okay? So you don't necessarily have to stick with one, but it's a good way to, to get a grasp on what's going on in the sentence, and then you can modify if you think it's necessary. So let's start with when, and then the way you translate the participle as the, as the verb of a subordinate clause, we've left, a, we've left, out, left something out. Translate the particle as the verb of a subordinate clause whose subject is either the noun, that's the subject, or a pronoun, the noun that it agrees with, or a pronoun derived from the noun that the participle agrees with. Is either, whose subject is either the noun or the pronoun derived from the noun that the participle agrees with. So let's try that again. You translate the participle as the, as the verb of subordinate clause, and the subject of that subordinate clause is either the, the noun or a pronoun derived from the noun the participle agrees with. So we said that thuon agrees with ha poietes. So we can say, that when the poet sacrifices the animals, we made it into a subordinate clause whose subject is the noun. Okay? We can say, when the poet sacrifices the animals, the poet is being saved by the people. We can modify the when, but we can also modify the repetition of the poet. We can say, when he sacrifices the animals, the poet is saved or is being saved by the people. So that's what we mean by the subject of the dependent clause being either the noun that the participle agrees with or a pronoun derived from that noun. Okay. So again, we, we tried when. Okay, when he sacrifices the animals, the poet is saved by the people, is being saved by the people. We can do if he sacrifices the animals, the poet is being saved by the people. That makes more sense. We could also do although he sacrifices the animals, the poet is being saved by the people. There might be such a situation. Uh, we can also do since he sacrifices the animals, the poet is being saved by the people. That works too, right? Mm -hmm. So in a given sentence without any context, we may not be able to know which one it is, okay? Um, uh, notice that there, there's no word that expresses the when, the since, the although. All those things have to be figured out by you when you're translating the sentence. Mm -hmm. um, and you have a lot of freedom, therefore, in interpreting what's going on. Um, but we're going to learn in the next video what are the specific words in Greek that you can use with participles to specify what kind of clause they are, because they're not 
the regular words for when, since, and so forth. Okay? Bye.